We are very excited to welcome Dr. Stephanie Edgerly, Associate Professor and Director of Research at Northwestern University's Medill School of Journalism with a specialization in audience insight. Her research explores how features of new media alter the way audiences consume news and impact political engagement. She is particularly interested in the mixing of news and entertainment content, how individuals and groups create and share news over social networking websites, and how audiences selectively consume media. Recent research projects include exploring how different individuals understand and make sense of the news media landscape. This includes a project examining how young adults define and distinguish news in creative and diverse ways, and a project uncovering different patterns of news exposure among US adults, and how this relates to levels of political and civic participation. Dr. Edgerly is currently working on a series of research projects identifying the factors that shape judgments about quote unquote fake news, and the various strategies people employ for verifying news claims. She is also involved in a multi-year study examining the political and new socialization of adolescents and young adults. Welcome, Dr. Edgerly. But before she comes on to give her talk, I would love to introduce my colleague, Reverend Zena. That felt a little like, here's Johnny. Um, so, in your life, as you are talking to people that you know, whom you want to do something, you know the tone, you know the structure of the sentence, you know how to get them to act. I was married for 37 years before my beloved passed away, and I knew without question, if I walked in with Woodford Reserve on the rocks, and said, Cookie, did you hear the, the, the lilt at the end of that? Cookie. I was halfway there. <laughs> if I walked in and said, Cookie, I was way far back. <laughs> the way in which we know people, and we know how to welcome them in, we know how to get them to hear us, is well-defined in each of us, and it is in the media we consume as well. But when I'm standing before my husband or my friend Elaine or my friend Jess, there's, 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 a, there's, a, there's a, a, a proximity where you can see body and you can hear tone, and you read it. You, kn you know what you're reading. When I pick up a newspaper or when I listen in passing to radio feeds or television feeds I might not be as attuned, but there is as much of a goal, maybe even an agenda there, as when I stand with my bourbon at trying to convince my husband to do something. How do we, Andre, after 37 years of marriage, knew how to hear me? How do we know how to hear? How do we know how to take in? How do we know how to consume the very media that shapes us and guides us? Doesn't matter to me what you're reading in some ways. Doesn't matter to me what we listen to. It matters that we know how to hear it and what to do with it. Among the highest goals of commu courageous communities is to be curious. We want tonight to equip for wherever you are, however you consume. We want to equip each other, one another, to know how to listen, to know what we're hearing, and to know what to do with what we're hearing. So get ready. I'm a Northwestern alum. You've got the best journalism school in front of you tonight with Medill. So join me in welcoming Dr. Edgerly. Thank you. Hello, everybody. The last time I was standing in front of a group to lecture in person uh, was March of 2020. 
So this is my first talk. I've, I've taken myself off mute. Um, I hope I remember how to do this in person. Um, but thank you. I'm really excited to be uh, talking with you today. And um, at my job in Medill, I sort of wear two hats. One hat is talking to news organizations and journalists and future journalists in the classroom about how they can better engage their audience and their future audiences. Uh, the other hat I wear is as a researcher, and my research um, focuses on the news people consume, why they consume it, and the effect it has on them. So I'm really excited to be talking a little bit more about that second hat, but during Q&A, feel free to ask me about any of that, that kind of first news-centric, um, what news organizations are up to. Um, and you'll see a little bit bleed into my, my conversation and, and my presentation today. So I want to start off by telling you a story that you already know. And it goes a little something like this. Once upon a time, not that long ago, our media system looked a little different. It looked like this, right? Small, yes, more newspapers for sure, but little variety, right? You didn't turn the channel or pick up another newspaper and hear something completely different. And really, over the last 20 years, it's looked something more like this. Loud, vibrant, colorful, full of choice, right? We have 24-hour news channels. We have political talk shows on channels like Comedy Central and HBO. Um, and that's just television, right? If we move to the internet, we have access to many online news sites. We have things called blogs. Newspapers are now online. And of course, we have social media where you can consume news next to more information than you would ever want to know about your friends, family, and coworkers, right? And on top of that, we have a proliferation of devices to consume all of this media on, right? Devices large and small that you can wear that fit in your pocket, devices that can immerse you in a completely different reality. And so the big question for me, right, is what does all of this mean for how we consume news, right? Big, gigantic question. But let me give you kind of three, three things that really shape how I think about news and a lot of the research I do. Three shifts that I think are really important. First, news consumption does not look like it used to. People are developing different patterns of news consumption. Um, this is not going to surprise many of us, right? But print newspaper, which was once a staple and the main way that people were getting news, is now a minority. We still see television having a sizable role, but what we're also seeing is the increase of digital ways of getting news. Things like social media, like podcasts, like websites, like algorithms, um, apps, uh, searching websites are on the rise. Um, so, and if this question is, is some Pew data from last year asking uh, U.S. adults which of these options they prefer to get news from, right? So a little bit of a forced choice there, right? Well, what is your preferred method? Um, and I'm curious, so let's just kind of take the temperature of the room. We'll ask you to raise your hand. Raise your hand if your preference for getting news, we're going to start at the bottom, your preference for getting news are print publications. Okay. Nice. Uh, radio? Got anybody radio? Oh, look at that. Television. Preference for television. Okay. And digital platforms. All right. Okay, so smattering here. And as you may predict, you do see uh, some age difference in here, right? Um, younger people tend to prefer the digital platforms. Older people tend to prefer print and also television. Um, if we just look at use, right, this was asking what's your preference. If we just look at use, about half of US adults say they get news, often or sometimes, through social media, right? So with these more options, of ways to consume news and how we're stumbling upon or seeking out news, comes a second shift, right? Real concern about what is real and what is fake, right? With so many options, right, we worry that all news is not created equal. 
right? We worry about the quality of information. Uh, this is some data out of Oxford from the Digital News Report uh, saying 67% of US adults are concerned about what is real and what is fake. And what I like about this report is it actually included 40 countries. The US is just one of them. The global average is 55%. Right. And I do have a chart at the very end if you want to see like where the US falls among the 40 countries. But this is a worldwide concern. Right? People are really worried about what is real and what is fake. Now, that could be good. Right? You could say, like, yeah, yeah, people should be worried about what is real and what is fake. I think absolutely. But what I kind of worry about is, and what I think is really important is what people do with that concern. Right? How does that motivate them? And this is the third trend that I want to talk a little bit about, which is, for some people, that concern, knowing that there is fake information out there, knowing that there's real information, knowing that the stakes are high and you don't want to make a mistake, can actually make people check out. Right? So 41% um, of US adults say that they avoid the news often or sometimes. Okay. Now, I will also tell you that I do think taking some breaks from news can be good, right? I'm less worried about that. I think oftentimes that's a strategy for regular news consumers is to take a little break and then jump back in, right? Um, but what I worry about and what a lot of my research is focused on are kind of habitual news avoiders, people that regularly are not consuming news. These people tend to be younger, they tend to be women, they tend to be lower educated, and they also vote less and participate at a lower level, both politically, but also in civic communities. Right? And so this occupies a lot of my time about why people consume news and what we can do or don't consume news and what we can do about it. And one of the, the main things I hear, in addition to, I can't tell whether things are real or fake, is um, I'm overwhelmed with choice, and um, I have to guard my emotions, right? How news feels, and news is going to make me feel really bad and really depressed, and I you know, just can't deal with that right now. Right? So what this signals to me is that people need some help, some tools to make sense of all the types of media they're encountering in really different places. Right? They need some tools for navigating this loud, colorful environment. And so for me, this is where the concept of news avoidance, or I'm sorry, of media literacy comes into play. This is sort of the gap that I think this concept fills. And I provided you kind of the, the standard definition of media literacy, which is the ability to access, analyze, evaluate, and create media. But to that, I, as a, a media researcher, would also add what news literacy is supposed to do is make people more susceptible to positive effects from media, like learning, like community engagement, and more resistant or less susceptible to the negative effects of media, like believing false information, like news avoidance. Okay. Now, as scholars are one to do, I, I want to break this this concept apart a little bit. And I think there are, it's a big concept, we're talking a lot about it, especially in Illinois right now with media literacy. But really what we're talking about are three different aspects. First is knowledge about media, right? About different types of media, about media industries, about finances and business models. This is the concrete knowledge of media literacy. And this might be what a lot of you think of when we think of media literacy, right? Like you gotta know stuff, right? So you got to know how CNN is different from BBC, how CNN is different from Google News, what is sponsored content, what is a press release, right? That kind of factual working knowledge. But that's only one part, right? To be media literate, there's this second part um, that people feel efficacious. They feel confident and in control of their media experiences. That media doesn't just happen to them, or at them, but they have some control, some efficacy in steering the ship, right? In controlling their own media experiences, 
right? And I think that's really, really important too. And then this third component, mindful thought processing, right? Critical thinking skills. We want people to slow down a little bit, to not have fast, knee-jerk, shortcut reactions, right? And spend some time critically assessing what they're looking at, right? Asking some key fundamental questions. And why this becomes so important is because media is going to constantly be changing, right? Like right now, we're talking a lot about bots and deep fakes. What are we going to be talking about in 20 years? Like holograms, drones are going to be delivering. So, like, I don't know. That's, that's probably like two years from now. I don't know what we're going to be talking about in 20 years. Media is constantly going to be changing. So we need timeless skills, timeless critical thinking skills that will be able to be applied to no matter what we're talking about that in the future. So I want to talk about these components of, of news media literacy, media literacy, uh, some couple examples in how to uh, navigate the new media and the new challenges that come up. And so I'm going to talk through with maybe a little bit of audience participation, but I'm, you, mm, yeah, maybe. Um, but I'm going to talk through five examples. And these are um, from about four years ago, so nothing current. Um, very much things that I encountered. So you're going to learn a little bit about my questionable media taste through these. Um, but I want to sort of just talk through why these are um, and what are some of the questions or red flags that we might use when trying to figure out whether something is real or fake? Um, so I don't know if you'll recognize any of these. You don't need to. I sort of hope you don't. Um, but we're just using these to kind of talk about um, common elements that would maybe be helpful or not helpful. All right. So I'm going to start with the first one. And I know these are really tiny on screen, so my apologies. Um, this is from 2017, the summer. And it's referencing a protest uh, where white nationalists marched on the University of Virginia and Charlottesville campus, and they were carrying tiki torches, which ironically is in the news <laughs> recently also for a very similar reason, but I'll get to that in a second. Um, so this is a sign that the hardware store has put up. Okay. Now, if I'm asking you, is this real? Is this fake? What are some clues you would maybe use to assess this? Right, that you would want to look into? Anybody? Somebody might say, well, it's Twitter, right? And you can't trust anything on Twitter, right? And that's very valid. This is on Twitter, and so maybe you should have your antennas raised with anything on Twitter. Anybody else? Are they suggesting that it's actually a sign out of store because you can't really tell? Because somebody just puts like J, puts that participant in? Right, so who's J? We don't know anything about Jay. Was this a photo he took? Or what's going on here, right? Um, Jay has a little verification check mark. Does that mean anything? Maybe. I don't know. If you looked at it, he's an entertainer. So that might be some red flags raised. Um, lots of interactions happening here. Lots of retweets, lots of comments. Does that mean anything? No, oh, I don't know. It means something, but I don't know what. <laughs> Right? Um, so this is actually, what's really interesting about this example is that it's a piece of satire, right? But what's happened here, which often happens on social media sites, is that it's been decoupled from its original source. Now, if you had seen this second image published by which account? Funny or Die. Does anybody know there's a celebrity behind the account Funny or Die? Anybody know whose that is? Will Ferrell. All right. Um, so if you, even if you didn't know anything about this image, but you saw it was posted by an account called Funny or Die, you would maybe be like, all right, I'm not going to take this to be real serious. But what happens when you lose that context, when this just isn't a retweet and you see the original source underneath, somebody has taken this and kind of posted it without that satirical clue, right? without seeing that it's from the Babylon Bee, or the Onion, right? We lose that really important context, right? Here's something just to think about. Uh, the original post, right, ha which has a celebrity behind it, and that account has millions more followers, 
why do you think the original account, clearly marked as satire or has the cues for satire, has fewer retweets and comments than the one that doesn't have that and doesn't have a celebrity behind it? It's a very kind of interesting game to, to think about the psychology of, of what's going on on social media. All right, so let's go to a second example. This one, I was listening to a morning radio show, which is sort of like a mix of a little bit of current events, a lot of like pop culture with a tad bit of music thrown in. And they say, breaking news. Queen Elizabeth is going to step down from the throne and she is going to hand over the crown, not to her son, but to her grandson. And I was like, uh, I don't think she'd do that. Um, and this, again, goes to me having like misplaced knowledge about the royal family. I know way more than I probably should. But I was like, no, Charles has waited too long. They made an agreement. And I was just like listing off the things that because of this happens to be an area that I'm fairly well versed in that told me I'm suspicious about this. All right? But why would this maybe make sense? Right? And I'm showing you not not the radio show clip, but I went online and there, this is an example of a St. Louis television station that was also running with the same story. But why might this story make sense? Especially if you don't have, like me, a lot of information. Do I need to talk into that? No. Uh, answer isn't here. Oh. <laughs> um, why might that make sense, right? Um, Potentially, right, because the queen is old and William is popular, and so you could maybe see why that might make sense if you don't have a lot of knowledge about what's going on, right? But as you know, it's an old example, so you might see where we're going here, um, this was not actually the case. Oop. Try to walk to the other side, get closer. Um, and this website, as well as the radio show that I was listening to, quick hour later was like, ha, 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 bad. Just kidding, right? And you can sort of see the, the website here does a little mea culpa. Not really, though. They're like, false reports. It's not official. This was actually a Nigerian website that had reported these false claims. Somebody saw it and was like, ooh, big scoop, and ran with it. Right, and then news organizations had to do this uncomfortable thing of being like, oops, oops, are bad, right? All right, third example. Okay, I'm gonna ask somebody real up close, right? Up close to the screen. What is an indicator that something not, might not be on the up and up with this one? <laughs> somebody with real good eyes. That head does not fit, right? Um, so that might be a clear indicator that there's something suspicious about this. Um, now, these aren't always this obvious, but like, this one's pretty obvious. <laughs> what are some other, other clues that might be out there? The website. I have included the website as a, as a you know, tip there. Um, this is, website's no longer active, but you might say like, what is that? I don't know what that is. I need to check that out, right? Um, so, predictably, right, um, this is not, not a real, real headline, um, a real event. And PolitiFact had sort of alerted me that this was going on. And just in case you're interested, this is now going to be the second and final, I promise, Will Ferrell reference. Um, <laughs> but that's the original, the original photo um, that was very poorly photoshopped to, to misconstrue this, uh, this fake event that didn't actually happen. All right, next example. One of my favorites, maybe the most popular, so, so this one pe some people in the room may have seen. Um, but oh my gosh, there is a shark on the freeway in Houston. Hashtag Hurricane Harvey. Um, what are some indicators that this might not be true or that you need to look into it a little bit more? <laughs> some of you might be shark aficionados, right? And be like, well, if you know anything about sharks, you know that. Right, and just like I had a lot of knowledge about the queen, you may have some more useful knowledge about sharks and be able to use that to, uh, to kind of uh, raise some questions about the authenticity of this actually happening. Sometimes I get people saying, well, if you look at the reflection of the rear view mirror, that tells me that the water is like yay high and I don't think a shark could swim. Good, okay, great. 
Uh, the interesting thing about this example, if I can, is that the person who posted it, Jason Michael, who if you clicked on his bio or who he is, he's a Scottish blogger in Ireland, right? So that might be another indication of like, and he's vacationing in Houston, right? Like what, what's the connection here? But he knew it was fake, right? That's what he posted it to be funny. Funny in the time of a hurricane, questionable, right? But he thought his followers, his thousand followers, um, he now has like a lot of followers, um, but um, his thousand followers would laugh at it, right? So he thought it was a joke and he was trying to entertain his followers. But without that context, remember context and, and social media sometimes breaks that from us. If you didn't know who Jason Michael is, right? Always with the gags, Jason Michael. Um, you wouldn't understand the cues here or, or think that this might be a real image. And what's really interesting about this image is that the shark is famous. This image is famous. Check out the uh, timestamp on this image here from October 2015. And now we are in Myrtle Beach. And it's like, OK, guys, there's literally a shark swimming down Ocean Boulevard. Um, again, same, same thing. And then just to kind of cap this off a little bit, you have Jason Michael back at it again with the sharks, um, this time for Hurricane Florence uh, in North Carolina. We should put him on Michigan Avenue. <laughs> so now this has sort of become like a thing. So inevitably, predictably, in the, when there's the next hurricane, you will see this image pop up. If you click on the comments, it's like a mixture of people that are like, guys, this is fake. And people who are like, oh my gosh, I hope everybody's OK. Um, so it's sort of amusing to see the interplay between people who are in the know and don't. Um, now, if you will pardon, pardon this pun for me, um, but natural disasters are like the perfect storm for things like this. Why is that? Because nobody actually knows what's happening at the moment. OK, because like crazy things are indeed happening. Like during natural disasters, we see images that can like blow your mind away, right? Like the awe of nature, flooding, right? Earthquakes, fires that are like, I didn't know that was possible, right? So we're a little vulnerable in that our expectations have been punctured a little bit. Also, we want news. We want information right away, right? Things are breaking. I mean, maybe depending on our situation, we need to personally act quickly. But even if we're not personally involved, we want to know what's happening. And that means some of our normal kind of verification habits, we suspend a little bit because we want information now. And that makes us a little bit more vulnerable to things like this. OK, last example. Um, this one, I'm just going to go straight to the end of the chase here, is fake. Um, now, you might be saying, The Guardian? What? Did The Guardian do something really sloppy and deceptive? This is not The Guardian, actually. This is a, whoa. There we go. Um, a impersonation of the Guardian. And the only way that you would be able to tell, besides if you tried clicking on like the links, this was just a story that looked very much like the Guardian, except if you tried to click on other links, is that the Turkish I, it's a Turkish I in the URL, right? That's the only difference. Sometimes you see this with like an R and an N that will look like an M, right? So, but who, I mean, who's, Who's inspecting the URL that carefully? Nobody is. My message to you is not, you need to get a magnifying glass and stare at the URL. No, that's not what I'm telling you. But this is some sophisticated, deceptive stuff here. right? This is really overt and really uh, uh, deceptive. right? Trying to package a story so it looks like The Guardian and presumably borrows whatever trust that we would have from The Guardian for a story that, that is, has some strategic intent towards it. OK, so what five examples here. What are we talking about here? And this is why I like the concept of media literacy and words, right? Is because it evokes a vocabulary. It uh, reminds us of language. 
and how vocabulary and language can shape how we make sense of the world, right? Um, and so what we need is better words, better language to think about and talk about these things, right? Um, and so are these all examples of fake news? In, in my classes, we call fake news the F word, the F word that you are, the other F word that you are not allowed to say in class um, because it's just too simplistic. Right? We need better language that's more precise, that, that more accurately encompasses what's happening. And so here's just five different ways to think about deception and falsity, right? instead of that giant banner of fake news. Um, now, you can, these can be like seven different examples, 12 different ways. I like five here, but you can get more nuanced than this for sure. Right? You have satire and parody, which in and of itself is not bad, but that context becomes really critical. Right? Um, then you have things like misleading information, often due to poor reporting. Right? This is what I work real hard at at Medill to like, make sure this doesn't happen. But we do want to put that right, in a bucket, like the queen example, in a bucket that's different. Not good. I'm not happy about it. But it's different. Um, you have manipulated visuals. Right? The shark, um, the horrible photoshopped face. Right, We see this a lot on visual-oriented social media. So Instagram, big concern with, with manipulated visuals. Imposter content, so the Guardian example, right? where you have a website or a social media account that is impersonating uh, or trying to borrow the established trust from another entity, whether that's a person or an organization or a news organization. And then fabricated content, where something that has not happened has just been totally invented. Okay? So that, that meeting at the White House with the Photoshopped face like, just did not happen. Right? So in addition, and, and I'm sort of, before we move on here, I, I'm just curious. We've got five examples here. Uh, raise your hand if you would say you've encountered one of these types of information, okay. Raise your hand if you've encountered at least two, three, four, five. All right, okay. I, I don't know. I, that was an impressed face. I'm impressed, sort of, but I guess I shouldn't be. Um, <laughs> so, in addition to having different names for these things, I, I want to draw one other distinction for you, and this is the distinction between misinformation and disinformation. I should have named these things like much different, but I'll try, I enunci I'll try to enunciate very clearly. Um, when we're talking about disinformation, that is false and inaccurate information that's being shared or created intentionally. Someone knows that it's false, knows that it's inaccurate, and they're still sharing it or they're still creating a website to write about it. Different from misinformation, which is the kind of creation and circulation sharing of false and inaccurate information, but that's when somebody doesn't knowingly do it. Right? And this is sort of a nuanced way of looking at these things. Arguably, the same content could be misinformation if you share it and you didn't know that it was false. But then somebody tells you, well, and you find out it's been false, and you go, well, I'm still sharing it. Now it's become disinformation. Right? Um, so we can get into some gray, nuanced area that way. But I think this is, this is a useful distinction, right? is what is the intention? We can never and precise, but it does ask us to start considering what are the motivations? Why would somebody knowingly share or create false information? And our mind's eye might immediately go to politics, right? But there are other reasons. It could be to entertain could be to make people laugh, right? That's maybe not as horrible. Could be to make money, could be to get clicks, could be to cause confusion, right? could be to influence people's behavior, right? But it's asking us to kind of think a little bit more about why would somebody intentionally or an organization intentionally create false information. I'm gonna create one, I'm gonna add one more nuance here. And this is where I wear my journalism hat a little bit more. But I think we have the same issue with how we talk about the concept of bias. 
and media bias. This is not an on-off switch, right? This isn't, are you biased, are you not? I, I would like us to get to a more advanced way of thinking about bias, where we think about it more on a continuum, right? It's not, are you biased, or is someone biased, or that news organization is biased or not, but it's how biased are they, to what degree, right? So can we start thinking in gradations, right? I guess that would be point one. Point two, is what is the unit of analysis? Are we talking about an organization and how biased an organization is? Or are we talking about an individual story or a video or you know, a, a podcast episode, right? Both are useful, but I, I think it's important to break them apart, give language so we can think about them differently. When we talk about how biased an organization is, there we're assessing their record Right, their history over a prolonged period of time, and saying, you know, how accurately, how often do they get things right? And that can be really useful. Right? But that doesn't mean that it's the same thing for every individual story that you read. So while I hope at Medill that you know, a lot of my students are producing content and work at organizations that are on this less biased side of the continuum, that doesn't give those organizations a free pass that every article they write will always be on that side. It can be on the uh, higher side of the continuum. So I, I, you know, it's useful to break apart individual stories versus organizations' overall performance. And then the last or the third point is what type of bias are we talking about? Again, our mind eye often goes to Politics, conservative, liberal bias. Sure, yeah, and that's what we're thinking of when we think of a individual's, uh, an individual reporter's political beliefs influencing how they cover a story. But that's only one type of bias, right? There are others. And I tell you this not because I want to turn everybody cynical and like, oh my gosh, bias, but because I want us to get to a place where we own our biases where we allow news organizations, or we kind of force news organizations to be a little bit more open about their biases. And to do that, we need to be more sophisticated about how we're thinking and talking about bias. So beyond partisan bias, right, we have demographic bias. And bias can be shown in, in a couple different ways, like the overall tone of a story, um, who's quoted, so like sourcing practices. Um, which stories are covered and which stories are not covered can be an indicator of, of bias. And then the overall framing of an event can also be an indicator of bias. So I'll just briefly tour through these. I'm not gonna belabor this point too long. But demographic bias, that might be if a reporter from a big city travels to a rural town to cover a story on the environment, uh, <laughs> yeah. um, and they describe this small rural town as a simple slice of American pie, right? And it's a little pandering, and that's a, that tone is bias, right? A, a rural urban bias. Um, if you want to look at it in terms of organization, Let's say you look at an organization's, a year's worth of stories from an organization about climate change, and you see that out of 40 scientists that are quoted, experts that are quoted, um, only two are women. So that might be an indication of lopsided experts, and there's some demographic bias going on there. Okay? Um, other kinds of bias, a neutrality bias, this is often called two-sidesism where reporters can try so hard to be neutral, to show that they don't have a perspective, to be balanced, that they actually artificially create uh, two sides to a story when there isn't really one. Um, so maybe their intention is good, but it's still a type of bias that distorts reality. Um, corporate bias. News organizations, media companies are owned, oftentimes owned by like a tiny number of people, but owned by big companies. So not reporting on a story because it has some connection to your business interests, right? Um, that's corporate bias. Um, big story bias. This one I think 
It's what I think happens a lot. This would be the queen example right here. And that's where big national stories that you think people are going to want and will click on and will be so captivating and you chase after that, right? And that often can lead to a biasing and a skewing of reality, not to mention you're not covering something that maybe you previously would have. So all of this is to say that when we think about misinformation, disinformation, when we think about really overt types of biases, right, um, intentional and overt types of biases, we worry about this because it can potentially have some negative effects. So what types of effects can this type of content have on us? Um, again, I think maybe we default to like politics and how people vote. Sure, absolutely. Um, I would also throw out there, this is one that we, we saw in the last two big presidential elections, is that disinformation, the intention or the effect can actually be to stop people from voting altogether, right? So not so much trying to tell people to vote for candidate A or candidate B, but telling people, why don't you not vote? Right? It kind of sucks to vote for somebody you don't love. What if you just stay home? They didn't say it like that, but, right? but that can be an effect. Um, trust, right? the d decrease in trust can be an effect. Um, making people angry, upset, confused, so like feelings can be an effect. And then we can start thinking about what the effect are on other organizations, right? And I'll just give one example. Um, I worry about an effect of, of like disinformation and misinformation on news organizations is that oftentimes they have to shift their focus and they now have to say like, okay, well let's cover this thing because we're seeing a lot of chatter about this and people are confused and we want to do some stories clarifying what's going on. But that means they've had to stop what they were covering, right, which presumably is important. <laughs> in order to clarify and, and, and you know, thankfully um, address what people are, are kind of confused about because disinformation on a topic has risen up. So all of this is to say that there are a range of effects, right? And, and a lot of them, most of them, are, are really concerning. So what can be done? Before we get to the what can be done, I like the who question. Who should be involved? Who are the stakeholders? Uh, so I'm gonna ask, gonna give you like a couple seconds to, to think about this, but when we talk about stakeholders, when we talk about who has some responsibility to be part of the solution, part of the answer, um, who are we talking about here? So who are some of the stakeholders that can be part of the solution for reducing misinformation and disinformation? Okay, us, the public, right? Okay, we can do something. I love it, I love the confidence, I love the efficacious uh, answer there. Who else, what else? $300. Teachers, I heard teachers, so education, absolutely. What was it? Ad, ad revenue, right, advertisement, regulating that. Oops, I said regulating, that's an indicator. <laughs> what else? Government, politics, right? Uh, creating laws, and we're missing a big other industry. I'm sorry? So tech companies, right? So my point in outlining, and I mean, there are more, right? But those are the big five, right? Um, in a survey a couple years ago, this was in 2017, um, I surveyed US adults and asked them to rate those any guesses what the, the number one who has the most responsibility is? News organizations. News organ if those news organizations will just get, yeah. News, and then the public, then tech companies, uh, education, and government were tied in, in third position. So what I want to talk about, and, and I want to be really transparent that I think in order for us to have a fighting chance for solving that or, or sub significantly decreasing the spread of misinformation and disinformation, we need all of those stakeholders working together, right? There's not one solution here that's going to, to work on its own. Every, all of those systems need to be firing, 
right? We need educators that are teaching things in classrooms and outside of classrooms. We need news organizations that are better. We need a public that is more knowledgeable. We need legislators that are holding tech companies accountable. We need tech companies that are proactive and making some changes on their own, right? All of these things need to be happening. But let's talk about what you can do, because I can't control all of those things. I have tried. I've written many an emails telling you they're not that responsive to me. Um, so let's talk about what we can do in, in our everyday lives. And the first step I want to say is understanding how and why false information spreads. Okay. And there are two ways I think we can do this. First is understanding technology, right? And we mentioned ads over here, understanding click-based advertising, that that revolves around showing you what you're likely to click on and not necessarily what is the highest quality. We also have things, uh, technology like algorithms, right, that show us top things that are not necessarily the highest quality also, right? Sometimes people have paid for that top position. There was a Pew study last year that said, um, I think it was 55% of US adults did not know if Google News hired its own reporters. And I think it was 66% for Apple News. So we have these spaces that aggregate content, but a lot of US adults are like uncertain what really like, okay, but what does Google News do, <laughs> right? Like, are they reporters? And so we need to understand the technology of that. Related to what gets shared and what trends and what we see, it's so easy to share something, right? Like, all you have to do is be like, share. And here's a dirty secret, <laughs> dirty secret here. Several studies have found that uh, people on, the study was done on Facebook and Twitter, that it's around 60% of people who share a link don't first click on it. Right. And that can just grow like a snowball rolling down a hill, right? If we are, if we like the headline, but we don't know what's in the story, and think of that like scary guardian example, right? Like technology sort of helps this, this problem. Okay. Um, and then the other one, slightly tangential here, but I really like, you know, don't get me started on Facebook, but to, to talk about Facebook a little bit, I think we need to understand the advertising machine that is directing content at us. For a lot of us in the room, we spend a lot of time on social media, Facebook maybe in particular, and we really do not know what's going on there. And Facebook is not all that eager for us to gain an understanding of what's going on there. So taking some time to explore the things that Facebook has been forced to give us access to, but buries way, way, way far under the settings feature. For example, what I have up on this screen is looking at the companies that have targeted you and the terms that they use, based on all the data they have about you, have decided what you are interested in. And sometimes it's freakily, freakishly accurate. You're like, whoa. And then sometimes the algorithms and the, and the predictive targeting like breaks down a little bit. You might have like checked into a place once, but that doesn't mean you want to like buy real estate there. Um, but again, it goes into getting us to realize, although hang out on Facebook, you know, see cute photos on Facebook, but realize that there's a very sophisticated advertising machine that is directing things at you. Another thing you can do just in your newsfeed is for sponsored posts that say kind of sponsored right underneath it. If you click on the kind of three dots, and this is what nerd like me is one to do, um, it's really interesting to go down and, and click on the why am I seeing this box. And sometimes it doesn't tell you all that information, that much information. It's like, because we're interested in adults in the US. But sometimes you get really accurate 
Like we're looking for somebody that has watched this movie and lives in this zip code. And you're like, whoa, all right, Facebook. I used to have an exercise in one of the marketing classes that I taught, um, and this was affectionately known as the um, designing a ad to target your mom exercise. <laughs> and using the Facebook tools, it would be how many things do we have to add until we get to a target audience of one person, right? And you, I mean, think about, they, Facebook has like over, if you're an advertiser, they have like over 300 different items that you can throw in, right? Once you start throwing in zip code, education, interests, have purchased this recently, like you're pre, you, get, you get narrow real quick. <laughs> so again, technology and technology really advancing and us learning a little bit more about how technology can explain why and how false information spreads. But that's not the only answer. We're also part of the, the answer. We human biases, we are not robots, at least not yet. And we have some biases in how we react that are more prone to spreading false information. Couple examples of this, um, our identity shapes how we see information. And information that supports our worldviews, that makes us feel good about our identities, we are less critical of, right? And I say identities because we have many of them. Political identity is certainly one of them, but not all of them, right? Think of religious identities, work identities, family identities, and things that support or confirm our values, our beliefs, our team, we are less critical of. Things that immediately we see signals that they're pushing against us, we are more critical of, right? So we see that people are, are more inaccurate when they are reading things that um, support their, their viewpoints, right? Other things that maybe are less, less uh, loaded, um, negative stories gets more of our attention. Right? So if I'm an advertiser and not thinking with my like democracy hat, but thinking with my I want to make some money hat, it's like, well, uh, there's no incentive to have positive stories. You know what's really going to get us some money? Some negative stories, right? Um, also, things we see more often, we're more likely to believe, right? So now, you know, you see a story once and you're like, mm, that's a little crazy. But you know, I've seen this a couple times in my newsfeed now. I mean, and as I say this, you're like, clearly that logic is flawed. But when we're scrolling through, right, and we've seen something two or three times over the last couple days, we're more likely to say that's true. And then the last one I'll just throw out there is that we're more often, we're more likely to remember a feeling than to remember the source, right? We're more likely to remember that something made us happy or that we got really mad but we forget that it was like crazy Uncle John that wrote that, or that it was some organization you had never heard of. We just remember being mad, right? And so we lose some of that context. Okay. All right, so step two, and this one will be much quicker, I promise. Um, so understand how and why things spread. Now let's, how can we be a little bit more critical about the information we encounter, especially when we're on social media? And I want to be realistic here, right? My goal is not to like make you be an investigative reporter, right? We have varying levels of time and energy. I'm not saying you have to do all of these. All of these kind of vary in how much they're asking you to do. But what are some key questions that we can ask ourselves to help us critically analyze information? All right, so five questions. <laughs> First one, does the information provoke an emotional reaction? Do you automatically love it? Or are you automatically angry, right? Why might that be, right? Are we kind of reacting with our identities, right? Or has the article done something, done the work to make us trust it? Um, so starting to think, why might this story want me to be thinking emotionally and not rationally, 
right? So this isn't necessarily a bad thing, but a question we want to ask ourselves and reflect a little bit on is, is it trying to get us to react right away and emotionally? Is there anything suspicious about the headlines? So this is one that doesn't take too much effort, right? But headlines, especially if we're gonna, 60% of us are gonna share something on Twitter based just on the headline. Um, let's get a little, little bit of our detective skills aimed at the headline. Um, so does the, the headline have capital words in all caps? Um, does it have excessive punctuation? Um, is it a forward referencing headline? Like, you won't believe what so-and-so doesn't want you to know, right? <laughs> all of those are ways that are designed to get your attention, for sure. Like question marks designed to get you to click. So really successful in getting your engagement, but are not things that most journalism organizations will employ. Right? So something to just be a little aware based on headlines. Who is the source? Now this is a tricky one, right? Because you're not gonna know every source out there. And we can look at this a couple different ways. When you're on social media, like, do you know this person? Because oftentimes we see messages from people that we don't follow, right? They've been granted access to our newsfeed because a friend of ours retweeted them um, and that sort of thing. So the first might be like, do I know this person? Why is this here? Okay, I don't know this person. You know, let me figure out who they are or not give so much attention to what they're sharing. But also, organizations, right? Do I know this news organization? Do I know this media organization? You're not gonna know every media organization, right? Um, you're bound to find or encounter an organization that you have not heard of. I, this is sort of controversial advice, but I think it's okay to use Wikipedia. I think like, people need help, right? Like I want people to, to have some way that they can get the rough parameters. I'm not telling you to blindly believe Wikipedia, but Wikipedia will tell you how long they've been around. They'll tell you if there's been any controversies. Oftentimes, Wikipedia will give you a summary of like presidential endorsements. So it's just a nice framework to kind of get your bearings. I would also say, and this is also a controversial tip, is consult uh, media bias maps. Now you don't take those as, as Bible, right? But they're good frames of reference to just say, okay, well this organization is saying that, our, our, the media bias chart is saying this organization is over here. Do I see anything that supports that? Right, it just gives you a little bit more frames to, to, to critique, right? My message is not adopt what Wikipedia says and adopt what these maps are telling you but they can be useful if you've never heard of an organization. Is there anything suspicious about the article? This one takes more work. This one requires you to read the article. <laughs> but <laughs> as we know, people aren't gonna do. But who's cited? Who's sourced, right? Do you see that unequal, lopsided experts happening? Who's being hyperlinked, right? What types of sources are being hyperlinked to? Are there any editing grammar mistakes, right? That can be an indication that it's not a, an organization that practices journalism standards. What type of story is it? Is, if it's an opinion, that's fine, but is it labeled opinion, op-ed, commentary, analysis, right? And then one that, that it can be sort of provoking is why this story, right? Why this particular story? And then the last one is, can you cross-reference the story? So can you find common threads if you read a similar story from another organization? Right? What are some common touch points? Where do they differ? If you want to get really sophisticated or you have some time to explore, um, consult one of those media maps and go find a, an organization that's on a different area of the map and see how they differ. Right? Can you cross-reference which different sources are being quoted? Okay. I also like to give just the really helpful tip. Um, when you're on anywhere on the internet, but often Facebook, and you see an image like the shark or like the tiki torch, and you're like, are you saying you took that photo? Or right-click, right-click, 
And on the drop-down menu is search Google for this image. Off you go. You don't even have to like copy the image. You don't have to go to reverse image search. You just right click. Let me see if this image exists on the internet outside of, of Facebook. Okay. All right. So five questions to ask yourself in and of, uh, of itself. These are not indicators that something is, is disinformation or misinformation, but these are red flags, right? And when you start getting a lot of red flags, that can be an indication that you don't want to give this your trust, right? Um, so really, I like to think of this as look for red flags, right? It's not like the Guardian thing where it's going to have a giant fake on it, and you're like, hmm, I think I know what's going on here. But look for red flags. Okay, and if you've got a couple red flags, then that's something you want to be really wary of. And if you're really wary of it, do not share it. Okay? Now, if you want to make people aware of it, take a screenshot of it, but don't share the post officially on Twitter, on Facebook, on Instagram, and don't share the link, because that's how they make money, right? Um, so I just like to point that out because sometimes we want to like let people know, and especially because we feel so proud of ourselves for doing all this work. Um, but really, that's feeding feeding the engine by doing so. Okay, I want to end. I want to end um, on a terribly professorial note. I want to come back to this question of how does media shape our minds, and I think of that as media effects. Right? How do media have an effect on us? And really, right, uh, when we think about early media effects research, it's a little something like this, right? That media has this powerful, universal effect on people. There's nothing you can do to stop it. It's like stimulus response. And I mean, as I'm describing this to you, you probably are like, that seems really simplistic and not reality. Yes. Okay. Um, I'm proud to say that like 100 years of media effects research has gotten us to a much more nuanced understanding of media effects in three ways. First, not everybody is affected by media. Some people are more prone to effects. Some people are less prone to effects. Third, or second, second, um, this effect can be indirect. That means it's not always a straight line. Sometimes some third thing can happen, right, which comes in between media and the effect that really hinders or helps media have an effect. This could be conversation with others. And then the, the third and final one is that this arrow can point the opposite direction. We can have an effect on media. So just to wrap up, what, what this means for me when I think about media effects, um, first, it's important to understand what people bring with them into their media encounters. We have skills, knowledge, biases that shape our media experiences. So it becomes really important to equip people with the knowledge, with the awareness, with the skills on the critical thinking skills um, that make them more prone to media having the good effects and less prone to media having the bad effects. And second, conversations matter, right? The spaces in which people consume and talk about and think about media matter. Those are the interventions, right, that ask people to stop and think and hear other people and reflect and have conversations with others and within ourselves. And that middle step can be really important to reducing or mitigating the negative effects that media can have and really important in boosting the positive effects that media can have, like learning and like community engagement. So as media is going to change and evolve and have more opportunities and also challenges, I just want you to remember, when we're thinking about media effects, people matter and conversations matter. And that's it. I'm so sorry I went over. Oh, no. <laughs> hey, right there. Hi. So I have a question. Um, d is media important? So you wonder why I asked that, but here's why. 
the 18th century philosopher Goethe says, humankind has the ability to carry out anything of which they are convinced. Humankind has the ability to carry out. It's on. Oh, my mask. See, I've gotten so comfortable with wearing it. Humankind has. I'm just going to be. <laughs> <laughs> we have the ability to do what we are convinced of. And what we are convinced of in this case, um, Yemi is my keeper, is that <laughs> that media is important. So what I want you to know is you have the power to carry out these steps, maybe not in their completion, in their totality, but I want you to look at your notes, and this will be up in a week or so. I want you to go back and look and decide on the two or three things that you and I are going to do to better understand and hold in our being the ability to seek out the truth. And I know that's a big word. It's important. And you told me it was important when I asked you. And according to Goethe, you have the ability, I think the quote is, you have the power to carry out that of which you are convinced. I will read these, and then we will come, we'll go back and forth between these and the audience, OK? Um, what is your interpretation of CNN's repeated use of the phrase? No, the oh. big lie. <sighs> Jeez. Um, I'd say, in general, I think oversimplifies things. I think oftentimes things like the big lie are more nuanced. And um, I think that perpetuates a knee-jerk reaction. And people are prone to immediately agree with it or immediately disagree with it because it's highly divisive. And I think a lot of our rhetoric is established in that kind of way. To, to be really simple. And I think, if anything, I hope what you take from me is that it's complicated. The world is complicated. Solutions are complicated. And our media, at least as it's, a lot of it is currently structured, is not built for nuance. And so what I'm trying to create, and not just me, what lots of people are trying to do is to create um, ways for media to, to be better at elucidating more nuance, but also talk to audiences, because I think we need to be receptive to that type of nuance. And some of that is why politics is so tricky, because we want to just think of things like red and blue, right? And there's so much purple, right? There's just so much purple. Um, so I guess that's, that's sort of my long, generic answer to that very specific question. So we will have um, 120 people between those online and those in the room have the benefit of your wisdom this evening. But our questioner says, this, this presentation, great points in the presentation that need to reach a wider out audience. How do we get this message out? How do we educate others, all of us? Yeah, I mean, that is why I think so many different stakeholders have to be involved. And um, we didn't touch on this, but I've done a lot of work traveling internationally. Um, I've done some work for the State Department where they've had me go to different countries and sort of talk about disinformation and misinformation. And one of the common themes that a lot of governments will, will run into, and, and I'm specifically referencing um, the, the EU right now and a lot of their work in um, reducing disinformation in, um, in, in a lot of Eastern uh, Europe countries is that they thought they could just correct the information and give it to media organizations, and then it would find its way to the right people. And what they quickly figured out was that you have to have community organizations involved, like that, that the communicator is really important. And sometimes media is the right way, and we certainly want to get media involved, and so they're more on that like getting it right most of the time side of the spectrum. But I think also trusted communities, churches, organizations like this, teachers, right, become spaces um, that are part of 
of this. Um, like for all we talk about decline in trust, right? And we know news trust down low, like trust in lots of institutions down low. Library trust up high, right? And I've done a lot of really interesting uh, interviews with librarians and, and talking to them about the types of questions people bring to them. And I mean, they're not exactly journalistic questions. They're not exactly like, is this true or not? But a lot of it is like reference questions of making sense of information. Um, and so I think libraries are an interesting space to be thinking about. Um, so although, long question, long-winded answer here. Um, although a lot of my work is directed at news organizations, audience news organizations, and that link, I, you know, that's not the only link. And these other outside communities become so important for, for getting the message out there, especially when we think about um, media literacy and we're teaching that in classrooms and that's great, but like, holy smokes, what about after you're no longer in school, <laughs> right? You're gonna need some help. And so that's where I think these community organizations become really critical to that, that type of teaching. Peter's gonna ask the question, and then Jess, you pick someone over there. And we've got a mic for Peter. Go. Okay, yeah, hi. Uh, I'd like to ask a really very kind of basic question to this issue. And that is, could you discuss a little bit about the balancing of the right to free speech and uh, the responsibility of media and journalism to the community uh, society at large? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know what exactly area you would want to uh, take issue with that. I would say, and I'm sort of cribbing a, a Stanford professor's said this, but um, freedom of speech doesn't equal freedom of reach. And so I, I think that's sort of the line that, that I draw, is, is people have the right to, to, to say things, right? But that doesn't mean they have the right for what they're saying to be amplified, right? And so um, I think we are thinking about that with social media and what that means in deplatformization and, and who gets to say what on social media. Um, I think we also need to be having that conversation with television, right? I think we've talked about deplatforming on social media, but I don't think we've really had a conversation about radio or television. And those, in many cases, have a much more immediate millions of listeners, viewers, audience. Um, so I, I sort of break those apart. You know, I think individual freedoms don't necessarily guarantee you reaching millions of, of people via media. Yes, is there a question on your side of the room? Someone over there, raise your hand. Anyone? Yes? Hold up. <laughs> Into the box. Right. I have two questions. Um, first of all, what would your advice be on social media when you see something that is obviously a, uh, uh, you know, a fake, mm -hmm. uh, uh, misinformation, misinformation or disinformation? <laughs> Do you advise to comment on it or let it go? Yeah, um, I think knowing the person, I'm gonna assume you know the person, uh -huh. right? That this isn't just an anonymous person that you happen to see on, on a uh, um, comment thread. Um, I would say if you know the person, nobody wants to be like told that they don't know what's going on um, <laughs> publicly or, or you know, with witnesses, right? So my, my first, response is private message that person, mm -hmm. right? And say like, and I also think it's all in the approach, right? And I, this is so much work and I'm not really good at it. Some people are very good at it. My mom's really good at it. Um, but I'm just like, that's not right here. Um, but I think you, you know, the approach is like, this issue is really complicated. You're probably seeing a lot of different things like me. Um, this was really helpful for me in learning that, mm -hmm. right? and then go in on it. Um, so I would, I would recommend doing it privately because people's, you get, get people defensive when their ego is bruised. And then there's a little bit of like softening the punch so you aren't just being like, you're wrong, here's why. Yeah. The only thing is I think, you know, sometimes you, um, you have to state what is right so that other people who are following that also begin to question whether that could be true or not. Yep. Um, and my other thing, I... Oh, no, just one. Oh, oh, oh. 
I had a good one. Oh, no! Pastor in me. Trump <laughs> <laughs> and then you. we'll come back. You might have to argue. Yeah, if not, come to me afterwards. <laughs> I live in Maryland now, so I can, you know, escape. <laughs> <laughs> we know where you live. Uh, what does journalism teach future journalists about truth and integrity these days in school? Yeah, um, I would say truth is a really, really interesting one to hear um, young people, young journalists talk about. Um, I would say like the teaching of journalism has had a little little bit of a, a reckoning. Um, I, you might like objectivity used to be the thing that that defined journalism, right? And and you can understand why that's the case. The professionalization of journalism, what makes my skills and my training special, is that I have this objectivity and I can do this thing in an objective way. And then that sort of got us into trouble, right? That worked for several years, right? And think of Walter Cronkite and that's the way it is. And you were just like, yes, thank you, white man. That is the way it is. Um, and there was some beauty to that, right? Like, and, and you didn't hear somebody else saying it differently. But now we've seen like the, the, the how, how objectivity can get co-opted, right? If we're just believing and that's the way it is, we're a little bit more susceptible because we're not asking these questions and then a bad actor could be like, but objectivity, and then I'm just gonna tell you, right? So we become aware how, how that's not great. So I, I, circling back to your question, I think instead of the view from nowhere, we're talking about the view from somewhere, right? And we're trying to teach journalists not to be opinion writers, right? But to understand how they have biases and how can they own them, not, not get rid of them, but how can they own them in their stories, right? Um, and, and, it's, and I think that's really provocative. Like I, I think younger people today, I feel weird saying that, I feel, they feel old, <laughs> younger people, um, have a really nuanced understanding of truth and, um, and bias. Right? And, and I think they, this is what's really interesting in, in working in a journalism school that's very old, we celebrated 100 years last year, um, is that many of my colleagues love objectivity and think that that is the cornerstone of journalism. And that I, stands right next to me, who's like, but I think it's problematic and we need to figure out a different way because I don't think journalism can survive if objectivity is the thing it pivots around. Um, so it's a much more nuanced understanding of, of truth, and I think that pivots with authenticity, right? Um, because you aren't detached, um, you're, you're trying to be authentic about your view and your position, um, which won't be for everybody, right? But, but that is a little bit more, um, more real, I, I would say. Um, that's my position. You talk to a couple different people at Medill, you'll get very different answers. But that's the state of journalism right now. So from our friends who are joining us via Zoom, can we create a sustainable model for news that doesn't rely on advertising <sighs> or data mining? Ooh. It's going to require us to pay for it. Um, yeah, so, so I think, you know, advertising in newspapers were like BFFs, right, best friends. Um, think of the classified ads. Um, I have memories of like my grandfather reading the classifieds. Um, and I went to grad school with somebody that actually um, analyzed the classifieds as um, like historical markers of our time is what people were selling and what they were charging for it. Um, so brief history, right? Um, Craigslist disrupted that model, right? And now it's been just a struggle to figure out where do you get that revenue from? And it's just not happening online, right? Like for all the reasons we're familiar with when you go to a website and things are flashing and loading and you're like, oh, go away. It's just not, not a reality. But what is a reality is that journalism costs money. Good journalism costs a lot of money. And so one way it's funded right now is through wealthy philanthropists. Um, but I don't think that's like a model for perpetuity, right? Um, 
I do think there's some really interesting things, and this is where I, I teach my students and we sort of talk about how realistic are some of these, maybe not so realistic. Um, but I think it's um, interesting to be thinking about news as a public utility or public good um, and what it means to um, invest in news. And some countries are a lot better at this. I think of like France gave every graduating senior in high school um, a free subscription to a print newspaper for two years. Um, again, that's like that socialization model. I mean, I'm not saying like then, oh my God, print will be back. But I mean, it's, it's trying to, to figure out how you grow the muscle of, of reading news. Um, other countries have given tax credits to news organizations. It's not giving them money, right, but giving them some of the tax credits that other types of nonprofit organizations get. Um, I think that can help. We spend so, I mean, it's in, been in the news recently, um, public media, but our country spends, the U.S. spends so little on public media compared to other countries. Um, and so I really think there's some movement there. Um, there's an, a scholar, Victor Picard, who uh, suggests that even if you charged 1% of Google or Facebook's annual uh, revenue, you would problem solved, <laughs> right? Um, so that's that legislative, like holding feet to the fire a little bit. Um, yeah, so, so those are some, some, some crazy ideas that I'm not super, super optimistic would happen in this country, but are some interesting thinking models. The really obvious answer is like, somebody's gonna have to pay for it. You're gonna, we're gonna need to get to a, a place where we pay for news. And um, some research is suggesting that actually if we switch how we think of it, and it's more like a donation, right? It's not like, I don't want to pay for this. I didn't have to pay for this. And we're sort of like mad because I'm paying for all these subscriptions now. Um, but people are actually like OK with like giving an annual donation. And you're like, well, you know, it's like the same amount of money. <laughs> but no, because we're thinking like, I'm doing something larger than myself. Right, like a subscription, I'm a subscriber, I'm getting access over the paywall, thank, very transactional. A membership or a donation that allows you and others to get access, like that feels a little bit more like, yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I think that's, that's really where we're gonna have to go. A question in the room. Uh, yes. So Almost everyone here is probably remembers a time before social media, but what do you, what suggestions do you have for educating our kids as they start out in a realm with social media full force from the beginning? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's tough, my goodness. Like the peer pressure to like have an account and be on it. Yeah. Yeah, and then, I mean, and you see the reports, you see the evidence of the negative effects that this type of content will have. Um, I think just from my personal experience, I haven't had much success in convincing 12-year-olds that they shouldn't do social media. <laughs> I think you just got a lot of things fighting against you and a lot of friend power there, and that's just not a realistic thing. So I think it's a lot of, of um, mediation, right? I think it's a lot of having conversations about, I try to be really open with my students about like, oh, I, I can't go on Twitter because it stresses me out right now. Like I try to, to own how like, I find social media really upsetting sometimes. I note that it has some uh, unrealistic depictions of events, right? Um, talking to people about, well, you know that's not really Kylie Jenner's lips. Um, you know, I think having that conversation um, about reality versus performance and what that looks like in, I'm, I'm going on Instagram hard right now because that's the top of mind one for me, but just how we depict our life and our friends on social media, having conversations about that is really important. Privacy is really important. I had this conversation with my niece, um, overshare a little bit, but she had, um, post an open, completely open public account and she was posting shots in a bikini. And I was like, you cannot do that. 
you either need to not post photos like that or you need to make your account private. And she said, oh, do you not want me to have followers? Like, well, not because you're 12 and posting bikini photos. No, I don't. But I mean, I, she just saw it, her conception of like privacy and the world and what was possible was just so, so different than mine. So I think it's a lot of having open conversations. I think it's a lot of saying, you have to follow me. I get to follow your account. Um, and I think it's putting time restrictions on it. And also, we should follow those rules, but we don't. So <laughs> those are rules for us, too. There's another question in the room. Um, sure, thank you. My original question was about um, if you thought the fact that journalism and neutralism in um, journalism was dead, but I think you answered that. But um, I think because of that, then how can we balance controlling what we read because we agree with it or it makes us feel good um, with becoming critical thinkers in really looking at only a fact-based article and coming to our own conclusions? I'm curious to your opinion. Yeah, I mean, I think this is a little bit about thinking, thinking about our media or our news diets, right? And um, we can think of this a little bit like food, right? And, and I think everything in moderation, right? Like, I, I, yeah, watch Fox News, but is that the only thing you're watching? Or what do you pair that with to make sure that you are, I don't want to say balanced, but like getting a balanced diet, right? And, and so I think it's really about pairing Right, how you're constructing an overall diet. Um, the the like horrible truth of it all is some of the not center fact-based stuff is more fun to watch and more engaging. And sometimes the really like fact-based, nuanced, complicated, let me outline all the points are like boring and hard to read. <laughs> Um, and so my message, especially when I talk to like news avoiders and they're like, well, I, like, I'm, I'm, if I wanted to try to start consuming news, like my message wouldn't be like, well, subscribe to the New York Times. Um, because I think that's just gonna like not work for them, right? Um, so I really think it's all about combinations of stuff, right? Um, play in the opinion stuff, play in the commentary stuff, be aware if it's that kind of news that's, that's affirming your position but try to combine it with things that you know are differently positioned in the media landscape. You don't have to consume them in equal proportion, but it's a nice check on it. Um, and so that's, that's my suggestion. Uh, this question is from our Zoom attenders. Can bias lead you to look only at alternative facts? You just keep looking for the same story told in different ways. In other words, What's the role of confirmation bias in this? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think that's, if you're searching for an answer, you can find it, right? If you're searching for a certain answer, you can definitely find it. I did a, an experiment where we were trying to figure out when people verify, when people will take steps to like Google something and see what else other people are posting and check a couple different uh, you know, information sites. So they weren't like specific things, but it was like, I do some work to like follow up on this story. Um, people were more likely to do that work when they read something that confirmed their beliefs and they thought it was true. And that was like not what we thought. We thought you would like be motivated to verify when you thought something was false. Um, and, and I think, I mentioned this because I think it's that confirmation bias. I think to take those steps is work. When are we going to do that work? When we think something's true. And when do we think something's true? When it confirms our beliefs. And I think that's the, that's the, the thing we have to push against. Um, but I think it's definitely out there, right? The cross-reference stuff, um, that's why I think, I always hesitate saying this because it's so controversial. But um, you know, they're, they're very famous media bias map um, Ad Fontes media bias map. If you Google media bias map, it comes up. They updated, I think they're up to like edition eight now. I do not think this is like absolutely how it is, right? Um, and they constantly update it and they're, um, so you need to take it with a grain of salt, 
right? But I think it's really useful. We do, in my, my journalism class, we do an assignment like critiquing it and, and where we think it's wrong and, and that sort of thing. But I think it's really interesting to sample from different sides of the map, right? And I think, um, you know, we're not gonna do that for everything, but, but I think, you know, for, for big things or for when you have that moment of like, I wanna check my biases, right? It can be useful to sort of play play on the different sides, different areas of that map. And that doesn't necessarily mean, okay, well, I'm consuming conservative media, I guess I'll go over to liberal. There's like nuance within conservative media, right? There are different qualities within conservative media, and the same thing with liberal media. Um, and so even playing within that is useful in checking, checking our biases. Because uh, I do think confirmation bias is real. Um, would changing com the Communications Act to make digital platforms, the ones you've talked about, meet the same standards as traditional media regarding the content posted make a difference? Is it possible? <laughs> yes. And I mean, it's, it's, you know, we look back at like and think, why weren't we regulating ads online, right? Why weren't we regulating online media? And uh, like pre-2016, it was like, because we just didn't really know what online was all about. And it was like, well, I, I'm not sure that was the case. But yet somehow we got to a spot where we weren't, advertising is heavily regulated in television. There are clear rules of what you can and cannot do. And yet somehow we weren't applying those same things online. We're not applying those thing, same things to social media. You know, you could have a foreign company that could have an ad about our election and Facebook was okay with that because it wasn't against the law. Could not happen on television, but could happen online in, in, um, on Facebook. Um, so I think, I don't think it solves the problem, but I think holding online spaces to a similar standard of regulation is important and, and a step in the right direction. I also, to be really frank, think the US is really behind other countries, particularly Europe in that, especially related to issues of data privacy. Um, so we're not, we're not leading the way in that. We tend to be a little bit of a follower. But um, yeah, I do think that's one, one helpful direction. I didn't see any other hands go up for uh, uh. <laughs> Ms. Bergen. So I think something that you like referenced throughout your presentation is that t the media can get really overwhelming and you know a lot of people connect that to the 24 hour news cycle and the advent of having constant news at your fingertips. Are there any benefits to the 24 hour news cycle? Like I know that it gets lambasted a lot and it gets criticized a lot. Mm -hmm. Is there anything you can think of where you're like the 24 hour news cycle and endless access to news is great because I think maybe it helps people who have different habits. I don't, that's a horrible answer, but um, Access. yeah, that, that maybe, you know, if you had a job that didn't put you home at 5 p.m., you were like out of luck. Um, and I think that disproportionately certain types of people have jobs where they are not home at, at 5 p.m. Um, so I think there's something to be said about about greater access. Um, one of the things that gets me really excited, and, and here's a shout out for, for Snapchat, right? Like crazy social media. Except one of the things I think Snapchat was really smart about with their Discover feature, is that they have a set number of stories that they publish each day. So people feel like they can like finish. Not that you can like finish the news, but there's an amazing amount of like, I did it. Like think of like when you would read the newspaper and you were like, and done. Well, many of you still do read the news, print newspaper, but um, what does that look like with the endless scroll and the constantly updating and right? And so I do think like, although I'm now taking your question, not what you asked me, which was the good part. Um, I, I, I do see there's kind of a circle back to slow journalism and really giving people like, here are the five things for you to read in the morning and maybe here's five to read in the evening. So people can feel good about themselves instead of like they can never finish. That's I a think, great question though. 
And I think it builds on, my thought was around like, you seem so optimistic and energized about <laughs> this topic, yet for many of us, it's just like overwhelming and it feels negative and it mm -hmm. doesn't, you think like, what's the way forward for this? So what are those like other things that make you, you know, have this tone and be optimistic about the future when, you know, your earlier comment, we're so far behind in the US. Yeah, I mean, I think even when I talk to news avoiders, which, you know, I'm like failing in that, it's real hard, real hard to get news organizations to care about people that don't consume news. Um, but I, I get so energized because I've yet to meet somebody that didn't care about what was happening in their community. And so while I think there is some big challenges between like news and like what news means and, and what it looks like and how it finds people and expectations for news, um, I'm really optimistic because I think at the core, people care about the places they live in. They care about schools. They care about the planet or at least their immediate planet. <laughs> um, and, and so for me, that's like the name of news, right? That's, I, I had somebody tell me, like just as an aside when I was talking about this topic, I just wish that I could pay somebody to do all the work you were telling me about to do all the work to figure out whether something is true or false. And I was like, oh my God, that's journalism. <laughs> I was like, that's what you're doing. Like when you pay a news organization, you're like paying for somebody else to like do the hard work that you don't wanna do, which is figuring out what's, um, and so I, I, that's, that's why I'm excited is that I, I think people care. It's just a matter of like figuring out the other big problems with finance and the packaging and like who's the, the target audience, which is a little skewed, I think, in the wrong direction. I'm going to ask you now to turn to your tables, and we've got two questions that we want you to spend just a few minutes talking to one another about, and then we will say another thank you to Dr. Edgerly, and we will close. Um, here are the two questions. What are some of the challenges and difficulties you face when trying to determine if something is misinformation or disinformation? What are the challenges you face? Second question, what could be done to reduce the challenges you face? What are the challenges you face as you're presented with information and disinformation? And what could be done to reduce some of those challenges? Would you turn to your tables and we're gonna go, seven is the number of perfection, so we'll go seven minutes and we'll come back. Beloved, I know the hour is late, um, but let me ask uh, with, with, with some trepidation, because the answers have to be short, if there's something burning, Jess has the, the cube and I have the mic, if there's someone who has something that they just need to say in this room, let me know, let us know. No? Yes. Well, my mask down so you can hear me. So I was a journalism major. So when I look at the news now, it makes me a little bit crazy because I do feel it's a lot of uh, bias. But I went back to what David French said um, two times ago, is to try to look at an issue and go to the opposite viewpoint first. Find a reliable source, look at that source, read it, and then do your confirmation bias. <laughs> and then you might have more insight into it. And also to just choose the topics that are important to you, because I think everyone at this table agreed, you can't look at every news story and understand what the, the sides of it are and to try to triangulate it to get to the truth, but you can pick what's important to you. Can I just add on to that real quick? David French also, I think, said when you're doing that, to make sure that you are sourcing the most reputable yeah. you know, source of the, of, the, of the paper or journalism or the opposite view, not just any old thing. Anything, anything else burning? I know you're shocked. Yeah, I am shocked, just absolutely. <laughs> yeah, so, um, yeah, so something that I was kind of thinking about as we were discussing tonight is that I have a bit of a different perspective than most people in the room in that I've only ever known the 24-hour news cycle. And I've also grown up in an era of largely bad news being reported. I've grown up in a post-9-11 era. I started to really be aware of the news during the recession of 2008. 
Um, I've seen school shootings and bombings and pretty much every bad piece of news. And I don't have any context for Walter Cronkite saying, you know, that's the nine o'clock news, good night. I don't know, I don't know how to deal with the news ending because that's never been the case for me. And I think like stepping back and realizing that like we're all impacted by that, especially those of us who have grown up knowing nothing else and only knowing like consistent bad news and like I don't think there's an end to Apple News. Like, I'm pretty sure you can just keep scrolling and scrolling and scrolling, and like suddenly it's 3 a.m. and you're even more depressed. Like, it's not. You never wanted to know about, and I think that it's really important to think about not just bias, but also about how being constantly overwhelmed is in itself inherently like not great. So, I beg your pardon? Oh, um, so I, if you have a piece of paper before you, can you write down one thing that you don't want to forget from tonight? Pull out your phones if you don't have paper. <laughs> I'm 65 years old, I always have paper and a pen. I, I, need a I, I, I have one in my bag. <laughs> Uh, I, I'm serious about this. Maybe put, if, you, if you're doing it in your phone, put it on today's date and make it show up like in three months. Put a reminder so it will show up. Because here's why. We are, as my sister Abigail just said, in easily inundated. But when we hear truth, when we hear something that resonates with us that that's important to us, it can take root. But like any other seed, it's got to be nourished. I don't know what you heard tonight that's important for you. I pray it was something. And I don't want you to forget it. That people share things without reading it. I don't want to forget that. Because I can ask some of my friends, did you read this? What did you hear that you don't want to forget? Chronicle it. Be a journalist. Write it down and remind yourself. Because if Gerda's right, you really do have the power to follow through anything that you feel strongly. And tonight, we were challenged to be better consumers of media and to be better teachers for those we love. How is this a courageous conversation? Because whatever you just wrote down there's somebody at your Thanksgiving table, at your dinner table, in your Rotary Club, I'm gonna stop, <laughs> that needs to hear it. And now because you've written it down, you'll remember it and can be convicted of it. And like Gerda said, have the power to enact it. Thank you for being here tonight. Join me in thanking Dr. Edgerly. Next month, join us once more in the year 2021 as we think together about what these courageous conversations mean and how they build courageous communities. Good night, everybody.